Good morning, folks. We will begin with the plasma filament. It rode over the eastern limb near the equator the past 36 hours, the dark dancer in front of bright umbral magnetic fields. It released last night. Some ejecta was created, but most fell back down into our star. The eruption is not heading in Earth's direction, but rather Venus and Jupiter stand to take impacts from the shock wave. There are three more plasma filaments on the Earth-facing side of our star, and each could erupt at any time. That's why we watch them. The coronal hole is easily visible as well, more so here in 211 angstroms. The equatorial portion faced Earth already, and now the factors for quakes wane until Mercury conjoins the Sun later this week. I'll come back to that, though. Solar wind showing a slight density rise this morning, but nothing major. The magnetometers are calm and showing all normal along with the KP index. Solar flares? Not much to speak of here either, and the sunspots look unable to help unless we get something from one of the spots not yet visible and still coming in. Their bright fields are already visible, however. But back to the planets. The Saturn opposition was amazing for quakes, as it almost always is, but it's done now and we look ahead just a couple days for the conjunction of not just Mercury and the Sun, but Mars will have gotten in the mix as well, and something I didn't know, as you see Aldebaran pretty much in a line there too, is that Aldebaran and Antares almost perfectly oppose our Sun. That's a heck of a place for some inner system geometry. You can actually see a couple of those spheres on Soho Lasco. Mars moves very slowly. Background stars race past him. Aldebaran down below moves exactly with the background stars, and Mercury swings in quickly with a very short orbital period. Also, if you're looking for an evening show, we've got Venus and Jupiter at sunset, the beautiful moon barely askew. How about the old magnetic maps? These are very old out of date, but somewhat useful for pointing out the underground magnetic anomalies of our planet. It would be nice if the two that the US government had posted actually looked somewhat similar, but at any rate, we could likely learn more about earthquakes and storm tracks if we gauge the conductivity, and a group out of MIT just discovered a way to do that using Earth's magnetic field variations from lunar-driven tidal changes. Last note before we get to the weather. We are at 50 episodes of Deeper Look. Last night's was about the climate extremes of India, a topic I rarely touch and one that is unlike the regions we normally discuss. Death toll soared overnight from 500 to 700 this morning with the current heat wave, so forgive the incorrect figure in that video. In Los Estados Unidos, that's another set of heat and moisture energy driven in from the Gulf of Mexico. And because it collides with the western flow a bit away from where the main Gulf winds curl back northeast, we'll have two top storm alert zones tonight. But these change, so check your forecasts before sunset. High pressure, both east and west of Europe driving towards the center with a tiny low in the middle. The only clouds anywhere in that area are stuck there in the middle as well. Down under, I'm up at the cloud layer to see the collisions of southern air coming in from the southwest and a northeastern flow cutting down in. That'll cut through the center of Australia where they meet while a small low node builds to the south. Neither produce major cloud lines, but you should be able to notice both of them. We've got the polar vortex conditions and some shots of our star to close. It's 6.15 a.m. Eastern time and that's the news. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.